Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, um, we're going to do something very exciting. So um, we finished our discussion of time-dependent systems and quantum mechanics, and that completes our discussion of standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And what I want to do for the next uh, three lectures or so is begin to describe to you the theory of relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, this is um, a very deep uh, and rich theory. Uh, you, people teach whole classes on uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. And indeed, people teach multi-semester courses on quantum field theory, um, which is the uh, complete theory of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. So what we're going to be doing today is just introducing uh, some of the very basic uh, notions of relativistic quantum mechanics. And indeed, my goal for today is to describe to you, uh, first and foremost, why it is that relativistic quantum mechanics is such a uh, difficult and interesting subject as compared to uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which, as you know by now, uh, is a very easy, uh, easy subject. Okay. So we're going to begin with our study of relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. So um, the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to ask uh, the following question. So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, one of the things that we have learned is that the addition of symmetry, such as rotational symmetry, uh, translational symmetry, and so forth, uh, makes the theory simpler rather than more complicated. So uh, the example that you might keep in mind is that of the hydrogen atom or of a particle in three dimensions moving in some rotationally symmetric potential then the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation gets reduced down to a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation once you account for the, for the presence of rotational symmetry. In particular, you can expand in spherical harmonics, and then you get just effectively a one-dimensional radial Schrodinger equation rather than some very complicated uh, partial differential equation in three dimensions. Okay. So you might think that because the Lorentz group includes rotations, uh, in addition to uh, boosts, you might think that dynamics of particles in a theory that is consistent with special relativity, the symmetries of special relativity, would be yet simpler, even simpler than that of, say, a particle uh, moving in a rotationally symmetric potential. But the interesting thing is that adding Lorentz invariance, that is to say, the symmetry of special relativity makes the theory more complicated rather than simpler. And so the reason uh, why, so what I would like to do is very briefly begin our discussion of relativistic quantum mechanics by describing to you why that is, why it is the addition of special relativity uh, makes things uh, more complicated rather than less complicated. And the basic idea is the following. So when you start thinking about mechanical problems or quantum mechanical problems, sorry, um, where relativity is necessary, so that is going to be necessary when you have processes which have energies that are of order mc squared. So remember, that is the characteristic size. Uh, so for example, uh, if you take the kinetic energy of a particle, 1 half mv squared, and you start moving these particles at relativistic speeds so that v is of order c, then the energies that you're considering are of order mc squared. And at these energies, 
it is kinematically possible. That is to say, it is consistent with conservation of energy to create a new particle. So if you have a particle moving at relativistic speeds that is undergoing some interactions with something else, say, then the typical energy is of order mc squared. And once energies are of order mc squared, it's possible energetically to pop a new to create some new particle, to imagine some new particle uh, popping out of nothing being created in this process. Okay. And so what that means is that we really need to be considering when we talk about uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, theories where you have not just one particle, but where you have the possibility of creating or destroying particles. So in relativistic quantum mechanics, we are forced to consider, consider processes where particles can be created or destroyed. If you think about our, for example, uh, description of an electron moving in the hydrogen atom, then we solve that Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. We use spherical symmetry to reduce it to a one-dimensional problem, but we're always solving the problem where you have exactly one electron. Okay. Now, in a real hydrogen atom, you would have many electrons, and so you would fill up the energy levels using the Pauli exclusion principle. But at the end of the day, we're only ever studying a theory where we're only, other, only ever studying a system where you have a fixed number of electrons. You're not considering in that uh, system pr the possibility that electrons could be created or destroyed. In particular, uh, when we describe the Hilbert space, say, of n electrons in the hydrogen atom, n is a fixed number that describes our Hilbert space. When we start talking about relativistic quantum mechanics, we're going to have to construct a much larger Hilbert space. A Hilbert space that describes the, the possible states of the system with one particle, two particles, three particles, and so forth. And that's completely necessary just because you can see that uh, relativistic corrections are important uh, if and only if uh, the possibility of creating a new particle is important. Just to say this um, a little more uh, precisely, one could imagine, for example, particles that are moving very slow compared to the speed of light. And then you could imagine trying to calculate the size of relativistic corrections uh, to, uh, for example, the energy levels of the system. So one way you could try and get around this argument is you could argue, you could try and ask whether relativistic corrections to, for example, energy levels are comparable to those due to multi-particle states. So for example, you could imagine some process where you have an electron moving at one-tenth the speed of light, okay, so that uh, mv squared, the energy would not be mc squared, but we 1% one, one, 1 of mc squared. And well, you could say, well, that's less than mc squared, so you would think that it would be impossible to create a uh, new electron. So you might think that if you're studying an electron moving at one-tenth the speed of light, you could completely ignore the possibility that a new electron could be created. Okay. But in fact, that still isn't going to be good enough because you can see, for example, that the relativistic kinematics, by which I mean the equation for energy in special relativity, so just to remind you, if you have a particle moving with some momentum p and with a rest mass m, then the energy of that object in special relativity is given by the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. So you can see that this reduces down to uh, 
when p is equal to zero, m squared, uh, mc squared. And then you could tailor expand for small values of p. And the first term in that expansion is the usual uh, kinetic term, 1 half mv squared, or 1 over 2 mp squared, plus various uh, relativistic corrections. And then you could ask, uh, what would be the typical size of the correction due to this formula to, for example, uh, the energy levels of some system? And the correction will be of order v squared over c squared. That's just because that's the usual uh, relativistic gamma factor. That's the usual um, factor that controls the size of subsequent terms in this uh, subleading expansion. So these dot, dot, dot terms um, are suppressed by powers of v squared over c squared. Hopefully, you'll remember that that's the standard thing that always happens in uh, special relativity. Whereas the corrections due to uh, multi-particle states can be estimated uh, simply by noting that if you have some multi-particle state, then, for example, the change in some energy level due to the presence of some multi-particle state. So let's say that, uh, so just to be a little more explicit, let's say that you're adding some correction term to your Hamiltonian, then the usual formula in uh, time-independent perturbation theory says that the correction to the ground state energy due to this perturbation has one term, which is just the correction to the Hamiltonian. Uh, that's this correction of order v squared over c squared that we wrote down up here. But it also has other terms coming from the other states in the system. And what does this mean? This means that if you have multi-particle states in the system, they'll contribute to the corrections to this energy, to the ground state energy, even if you're not never considering a process where you have enough energy to actually create a new particle. So the presence of multi-particle states in the Hilbert space will lead to corrections. And the typical size of these corrections will be of order the um, typical energy of the process that you're considering divided by the energy of a multi-particle state which will be of order mv squared over mc squared. So that's also of order v squared over c squared. So what this argument is telling us is that we should suspect, based on this, that a single particle theory of relativistic quantum mechanics shouldn't make sense on its own. In particular, if you just to try and describe the Hilbert space of a single particle, using the formula, for example, uh, using uh, some relativistic formula for the energy instead of the non-relativistic formula for the energy, then you would expect that that uh, Hilbert space, that the predictions of that single particle uh, relativistic quantum mechanics uh, would not be a good, a good match to reality because the corrections due to multi-particle states would be of the same order as the relativi relativistic corrections uh, due to that single particle uh, relativistic quantum system. Um, in fact, uh, I would like to argue, so I would like to make this a little bit more specific, and we will show, I'll show you that in fact, a single particle 
relativistic theory of quantum mechanics is impossible. And in particular, what I'll, sh what I'll argue to you is that if you try and construct a single particle theory of quantum mechanics, at least just following your nose and using the standard rules of relativistic quantum mechanics, you'll quickly run into a contradiction. You'll find that it's possible to go back in time and kill your grandmother. And that is going to force us in trying to develop a, a theory of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics that is consistent with causality to consider a multi-particle theory. And then there are a variety of ways that one could go about and construct such a multi-particle uh, theory. And over the next two lectures, uh, after this one, I'll briefly sketch two of them. Uh, one leads to what is known as scalar field theory. The other uh, leads to what is to the uh, relativistic field theory, uh, the relativistic theory of quantum mechanics that describes uh, electrons. Uh, so that's given by Dirac's equation. And so we'll go through and develop the theory of Dirac's equation and use it to make some remarkable predictions. Um, for, so for example, we'll be able to uh, predict the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron um, and uh, simply based on uh, some straightforward applications of relativity to quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, so today, however, what I want to do is I want to convince you that single particle relativistic quantum mechanics uh, makes no sense. Um, and so uh, that is what we're going to try and do first. Uh, before I do so, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Okay, that is what we're going to describe. Okay. Um, so let's consider a single particle Hilbert space. So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, how would we describe that? Well, you would have a Hamiltonian which is 1 over 2m times p squared. And you would describe the Hilbert space, that is to say the basis of states, in momentum space. You would, by constructing some set of states that are eigenstates of the momentum operator, labeled by a momentum k. And then the energy of one of these states, of course, So these states are energy eigenstates. And the energy of one of these states would be 1 over 2m times k squared. Okay. So this is uh, the entire theory of a free particle in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So what happens then? If we take the same Hilbert space, namely the same Hilbert space, which has as its basis the momentum eigenstates, uh, each labeled by a momentum vector k, but with the relativistic Hamiltonian, where the energy of a state is determined not by uh, the non-relativistic formula, 1 over 2 mp squared, but by the relativistic formula, m, the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. So, so far in your lives as uh, quantum mechanics, you have not considered Hamiltonians where you have uh, some sort of complicated square root that appears in the expression uh, for the uh, Hamiltonian as a function of momentum. That is to say, you've considered dispersion relations, so relations between energy and momenta, that um, involve uh, simple uh, integer powers of the momentum, for example. And our goal, then, is to ask, what happens if we try and generalize our theory of quantum mechanics to include um, such a uh, Hamiltonian um, which would be, indeed, what I mean when I say uh, the relativistic sim single particle quantum system. 
So is it clear what I mean by this? So for example, our basis of states, again, is given by these momentum eigenstates. And these states will be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. with eigenvalues that I'll just call omega. So that's the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus k squared c squared. So let's now explore this theory and see if it really makes sense. So in particular, um, what I'm going to do um, for the rest of this lecture, just to make our lives easier, I'm going to use um, units where c is equal to 1, just meaning that, for example, I measure uh, distances in light seconds and time in seconds, for example. And also, just to keep our lives easier, I'll set h bar equals to 1 either. Again, that just means that we're using units where, for example, e energy is measured in units of 1 over time. Or uh, momentum is measured in units of uh, 1 over space. So uh, for example, time could be measured in seconds, uh, distances in light seconds, and uh, momentum in h bar divided by light seconds, if you want to say it that way. Then. This relativistic dispersion relation just says that these momentum eigenstates have energies which are given by the square root of m squared plus k squared. Okay. So, so far I've been looking at this theory in position space. What happens if we look at it? So, so far I've been looking at it in momentum space. What happens if I look at it in position space? So in particular, the quantity that I'm interested in trying to compute is the amplitude for a particle sitting at the origin at time t equals zero to propagate to some other point that I've called x here uh, after some time t. So this is what we know as a propagator. Uh, of course, uh, I could try and compute it using a uh, path integral if I like. Uh, this is a quadratic uh, theory, uh, so I could do that if I wanted to. But of course, I can also do it uh, much more simply just by uh, computing it directly using our form of the Hamiltonian. So here I'm using zero vector just to denote, maybe I should, that's not a very good notation. Let me just say the point where x is equal to zero. So this is the probability or the uh, amplitude for a particle to move a distance x in some time t. So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to insert a complete basis of states. And I'm going to use the fact that our Hamiltonian is diagonal in this momentum space basis. So what is that? That's the integral d3k times the wave. So this guy here is the wave function e to the i k dot x. And then here, I can use the fact that this uh, bra vector, this bra k, is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And so I get minus i times omega sub k t. times the uh, wave function of, again, the, the wave functions in momentum space 
e to the ikx evaluated at x equals 0, which is just 1. Okay. So this is the integral that I need to compute. And the first thing that I'm going to do in uh, computing this integral is I'm going to choose, so I need to perform this integral over the 3k coordinates. And I'll just choose a basis where the vector x points in the z hat direction. So of course, you know by rotational invariance, um, I can al I'm always free to choose my coordinate axes however I like. Um, at the end of the day, the answer that I get should depend only on the distance between the origin and the point x and not on anything else. So I'm free to make that choice. Then I could write this out in spherical coordinates. So I'll denote by k without a vector symbol, the length of the vector k. And then I have the theta and phi coordinates in a momentum space or in k space. So the theta coordinate is the angle off of the z-axis. And we have our usual uh, Jacobian integration measure factor that arises when you work in spherical coordinates. And then you have the azimuthal angle, or maybe it's not, I forget actually what it's called. You have the other angle phi, the one that tells you the angle in the xy plane. And then you have this exponential factor. Um, so you have the e to the minus i omega sub k t plus i times k dot x, which is just the length of the vector k times r times cosine theta. So in your mind, you should think of the vector x as pointing in the z hat direction. So here's the x hat direction. Uh, I shouldn't have, I'm using x in two different ways here, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Here's your vector k. There's the angle theta. And then you have this angle, sorry, I'm not, that's not a very good picture. But you know what spherical coordinates look like. I don't need to tell you much more about that. What's that? They don't work. Did I label them the wrong way? Yeah, I can never tell left from right. I'm, I'm mildly dyslexic in that, okay, point of view. Okay, so here's phi, something like that. <coughs> Okay, I can also never remember if phi is the angle off the x-axis or the y-axis or whatever, but you guys, can, you're smart, you guys can figure that out. Okay. Is that, okay, I feel like that diagram's so messy, it just makes things worse. But you understand what I mean here? I'm just going to spherical coordinates? Okay, good. Okay, so the nice thing to notice is that omega k is the square root of k squared plus m squared is independent of theta and phi. So I can just pull it through. So I get an integral from 0 to infinity, um, k squared dk, e to the minus i omega kt. I can do the uh, phi integral. So what do I get? I get some factor of 2 pi. And then I have the theta integral. So what is that theta integral? That's the integral from 0 to pi of d theta sine theta, or just the integral, if I want to write it this way, from minus 1 to 1 times d of cosine theta times e to the i k r cosine theta. So I can then just do that integral. It gives me a factor of 1 over i k r, so which kills one of the factors of k. And I have the result of that integral, so e to the i k r from the uh, one end of the range of integration and e to the minus i k r from the other end of the integration.
So this is the amplitude to propagate a, a distance r in a time t. And what we would like to ask is we would like to ask what happens when r is bigger than t, i.e., when the point x is space-like separated from the origin. So um, just uh, as a reminder, if you don't remember the terminology from special relativity, we say that points are space-like separated when you can't get from one to the other without traveling faster than the speed of light. Okay. I.e., one would have to travel at velocities greater than c to get from the origin to the point a distance r from the origin. OK, so let's then stare at this integrand and think about what it looks like when we uh, have r bigger than t. Okay. So this uh, transition probability, this uh, propagator, I'll just rewrite that for you. What was that? 2 pi over i r integral uh, k dk e to the minus i times omega k, which is the square root of m squared plus k squared times t times e to the i k r minus e to the minus i k r. Okay. So the way that I would like to think about this integral I actually am not even going to bother to compute it for you explicitly. But what I will show you is that this integral is non-zero, uh, which uh, is enough to conclude that uh, our theory uh, is actually quite sick. And the easiest way to see that this integral is non-zero is actually to think about this uh, integral uh, in the complex R plane. So in particular, we would like to deform the contour of integration. So what does the integrand look like in the complex R plane? So we're integrating along the real R axis from uh, 0 to infinity. Oh, yeah, I actually uh, skipped one step. So the integral up here is the integral uh, for as k goes from 0 to infinity. But I can write that just by noting that this term is related to that term by taking r to minus r. I can write this just as the integral of e to the i k r, where, uh, where k is integrated from minus infinity to infinity. And so then, sorry, uh, I said something incorrect earlier. Uh, we want to imagine doing this integral by deforming the contour of integration in the complex K plane. Okay. Sorry, I, I don't know why I said complex R plane. I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning. Um, OK, is everything clear so far? Okay. So we're calculating the amplitude to go a distance R in a time t. We've reduced it to a one-dimensional integral uh, of this quantity uh, dk. And that integral is along the real axis in the complex k plane. And let's stare at the integrand and think about what it looks like in the complex k plane. <coughs> so the first thing to notice, so we start by doing the integral here along the real k axis. And the first thing to notice is that since r is bigger than t, the integrand vanishes
when the magnitude of k, when the absolute value of the complex number k goes to infinity if it has imaginary uh, part which is larger than 0. So in particular, uh, you could imagine deforming this contour of integration that I have written here. And what we see is that if you deform it uh, into the upper half of the complex k plane, then out at infinity, that contour will vanish, or that integrand will vanish, just because r is bigger than t. So in particular, you could imagine trying to push the contour all the way up here up at uh, infinite values of the absolute value of k. And because we've pushed it into the upper half of the complex k plane, the integrand will vanish exactly. So you might therefore think that the integrand is exactly 0. Okay. And that would be great, because that would mean that our particles can't travel faster than the speed of light. Um, but there's a little bit of a subtlety here, which is that the function that you're looking at here has a branch cut because it has a square root. And there will be two branch points at k is equal to im and minus im. And there'll be branch cuts going off to infinity from there. So that when you do this contour integral, when you deform the contour, you need to take into account the fact that your function is crossing this branch cut at uh, large imaginary values of k. And so the easiest way to take that into account is to deform your contour of integration so that it goes around the branch cut like that. And then the contribution that you get to the integral will just come from the integration along the branch cut. So you'll get, so in order to perform the integral along the branch cut, let's just let um, k be equal to iz. And then we want to perform the integral where z runs from m to infinity. So this is 2 pi over ir. So there'll be two factors of i coming from uh, this factor of i uh, that occurs when you change variables. So z dz. And then we just need to uh, write down the integrand when um, uh, with z replaced by uh, k, with k replaced by z. And so you have an e to the zm. sorry, ZR, coming from this term here. Actually, we need to be, yeah, E to the ZR. And then we need to integrate the uh, difference between the two, th we need to integrate the difference between the function on this side of the branch cut and the function on that side of the branch cut. Um, what is that? That's E to the square root of z squared minus m squared t. That's the function on one side of the branch cut minus the thing that you get on the other side of the branch cut where the square root has the opposite sign. Or, just to write this out a little bit more explicitly, z dz times e to the zr times the cinch of the square root of z squared minus m squared t. Any questions about this manipulation? Yes. Um, how does k have a positive imaginary value? Oh, um, well, I'm just using, so I want you to remind you of uh, the method of uh, complex integration where you deform contours. So uh, the thing that you, you need to remember is that if you ever have a function which is an analytic function, okay, meaning that you can regard it as a function of complex k, 
for example, then you can always deform then the integral over some uh, curve in the complex k plane can be deformed any way you like. So all we can imagine doing is taking this contour and pushing it up like that. Okay. So this is hopefully, so for example, if you remember Cauchy's residue theorem, this says that the integral of a contour around some curve is just the sum of the poles uh, inside the curve, uh, you know, the sum of the residues of the poles uh, inside the curve. Um, and uh, this is exactly what we're doing here. We're just imagining deforming the contour in the complex plane. And uh, the only subtlety we have is that we actually don't have an analytic function. We have something that's analytic, except it has a branch cut. Um, what does it mean that it is a branch cut? Um, it means that when you take, uh, the, I mean, the square root function has a branch cut in the sense that it has two possible values, either a plus sign or a minus sign. And um, well, uh, we need to take that into account when we perform this integral. So is this method of deforming contours familiar to most of you? Um, if it's not, uh, this is the only time I believe in this course that I'm going to use it. Okay. So um, don't worry about it too much. And the important point is that this is a positive definite quantity. In fact, one can do that integral. I think it's some Bessel function, something like that. But I don't care about the exact value of the function. I just care that it's non-zero. And it's important to uh, go back and remind ourselves of why it was non-zero. Why was it non-zero? It's because of that square root. Okay. And why was there a square root present? The square root was present because h squared was the, h was the square root of m squared plus p squared. It's the fact that you have that square root appearing in the theory of, uh, in the uh, formula for energy and special relativity that's leading to this problem. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that in a theory of relativistic quantum mechanics, where uh, we just have this single particle Hilbert space, there is a small, but non-zero probability that a particle can travel faster than the speed of light. In particular, remember we were considering the case where r was bigger than t, meaning that we were considering the amplitude for a particle to get from one point to another where the only way that a part, the, the only way you could get from those two points between those two points was traveling faster than the speed of light. And as uh, hopefully you remember from your class on special relativity, traveling faster than the speed of light is the same as going backwards in time. In particular, a process uh, that to one inertial observer looks like it is uh, describing something going faster than the speed of light would look to a different observer moving at a different relative velocity like the particle is going backwards in time. So any theory, any relativistic theory where it's possible travel to travel faster than light, it's also possible to go backwards in time. So in particular, uh, there is no notion of causality in this theory possible to go back in time and uh, kill your grandmother. Right. This is, or maybe it's your grand, the grandmother paradox or grandfather paradox. I, I forget whether you're supposed to kill your grandmother or your grandfather. Okay. It's one of these uh, 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 you know, arguments that any theory where you can go backwards in time um, is inconsistent. So um, the question then is how can we avoid this? Uh, maybe I should pause and see if there are any questions on the argument that I gave uh, previously. It's not good to go back in time and kill your grandmother. It's, I strongly frown upon it. So the question then is, how can we avoid this? So before uh, diving into any details of how we would construct a theory 
where particles can be created or destroyed. Uh, let me just uh, run through a bit of dimensional analysis. So let me remind you that in practice, we never localize particles exactly. So for example, if you want to ask whether a particle has traveled from one point to another, and you want to ask whether uh, uh, it's possible for a particle to travel between one point and another point, which is space-like separated from it, then you need to perform some experiment where you're localizing the particles. And if you localize particles on a distance scale L, then that means that they have an uncertainty in their momentum greater than 1 over L. Remember, we're using units where h bar is equal to 1. And in particular, they have an uncertainty in their energy, which is greater than 1 over L as well. Remember that in special relativity, energy is linear in momentum rather than quadratic in momentum, as it would be in um, non-relativistic physics. And so if you try and localize particles on smaller and smaller scales, so say, for example, the distance scale set by the inverse mass, then the energy will be larger than the mass of the object. And it's, it's impossible to tell if you have one or many particles. In particular, just as it's impossible to determine exactly the position, the momentum, or the energy of a particle, it's also impossible to determine uh, exactly whether you have one or many particles. Okay? And the way that we could diagnose that is looking at the variation in the energy, the variance in the energy operator, the Hamiltonian. And if the variance in the Hamiltonian is larger than the typical energy required to create a particle, then it's impossible to decide whether you have one or many particles. So in particular, you can see that if you try and localize particles exactly um, to, indeed, to actually perform an experiment where you would diagnose whether particles travel faster than the speed of light, you can never tell whether you're actually studying one or many particles. And indeed, the very notion of what it means to have a single particle as opposed to many particles is one that you would have to uh, consider very, very precisely. Okay. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay. So this leads us naturally to the question is how do we construct a theory of multiparticles allowing for variable numbers of particles, so processes that change the number of particles, and in particular, allowing for the creation and destruction of particles. I should actually mention as an aside that although I'm introducing uh, the subject of particle creation and destruction in the context of relativistic quantum mechanics, it's also a theory that has many other applications. So for example, in materials physics and condensed matter physics, um, this is something that we consider uh, all the time. Um, so the low energy excitations of some material uh, can be described effectively as particles. Okay, we actually saw that when we developed the Debye model, when you guys developed the Debye model of solids uh, in one of your problems, you saw that there were phonons, which were these particle-like excitations of materials. And indeed, um, it's frequently the case that the low temperature uh, behavior of all sorts of materials uh, are, are, are described precisely in terms of uh, the uh, sorts of multi-particle Hilbert spaces that we're now going to construct. So our goal then is to construct a Hilbert space which includes not just the single particle states labeled by 
uh, a momentum k, but all sorts of other states as well where you can have an arbitrary number of particles. So um, the way that I'm going to do this um, is uh, I'm just going to first define for you the Hilbert space and write down for you the natural Hamiltonian. And then we'll try and understand what the uh, natural operators and observables are for that Hilbert space, which will give us a nice physical interpretation for our theory of particles. So if you're going to have a Hilbert space, which has particles that can, uh, with an, a number of particles that can vary, then the first thing you want is you want a state in your Hilbert space where there are no particles. And then we also want uh, a part of our Hilbert space where you have one particle. So these will be the usual one particle states that we were considering earlier that will be labeled by their momentum k. But we would also like to have two particle states, which will be labeled by a pair of momenta, the momenta k1 and k2 of our two particles. And I would like to describe a theory where our particles are indistinguishable so that this state uh, is the same if you switch k1 and k2, and so on and so forth. We would like to have three particle states specified by three momenta, four particle states by four momenta, and so on and so forth. And the simplest way that we could imagine constructing such a Hilbert space would be just to take the Hilbert space spanned by this no particle state. So that's a one dimensional Hilbert space, call it H0. And the Hilbert space spanned by our one particle states, okay. Uh, that's the usual Hilbert space that we always consider in quantum mechanics of a particle in three dimensions. And then we would like to add to that the Hilbert space H2 of two particle states, and so on and so forth. And our total Hilbert space will just be the direct sum of these guys. What does that mean? It's the Hilbert space spanned by um, the set of all basis vectors where you specify first the number of particles and then you specify uh, the momenta of each one of those particles. Okay. And this is often known as a Fox space. That's just a bit of uh, terminology. So um, for example, the identity operator in this Hilbert space is the identity operator in H0 plus the identity operator in H1 plus the identity operator in H2 plus so on and so forth. The only subtlety being that we need to include a factor of 1 over 2 here to account for the fact that when you integrate dk1, dk2, you're actually over counting because you have that symmetry that interchanges k1 and k2. So I've included a factor of 2 there to account for that. And that is actually not just a factor of 2, but it's a factor of 2 factorial, uh, also known as 2. But I write that factorial symbol there because it makes it clear that when you write down the dot, dot, dot terms, you'll have a 1 over 3 factorial, 1 over 4 factorial, and so on and so forth. OK. So in order to, uh, so in order to parameterize this Hilbert space a little bit more efficiently, I'd like to come up with a new way of labeling our basis states. In particular, I'd like to label each basis state by a function that I'll call n of k. 
where n of k is the number of particles with momentum k. And I'll normalize it to have a delta function so that, for example, the state k1, a state, the, the uh, state where you have a single particle with momentum k1 is described by the function n of k, which is a delta function, k minus k1. I suppose I should write that as a three-dimensional delta function. The state with two particles with momenta k1 and k2 is given by the function n of k, which is the sum of two delta functions, one at k is equal to k1, and one at k is equal to k2, and so on and so forth. So a basis state is then, so a generic basis state is then labeled by a function n of k. And we can then define the operator capital N, which measures the number of particles with momentum k, so that n of k acting on one of these basis states is just given by that sum of delta functions. Why is that useful? Well, it's useful because it gives us an extremely compact way of writing out the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian should be the sum over all particles of the energy of each particle. <coughs> and that can be written as just the integral d3k of omega sub k times the operator n of k, where omega k, as usual, is the square root of m squared plus k squared. So for example, if you act H on a single particle state where n of k is a delta function with k is equal to k1, then you use the delta function to do the integral and you get the energy of a particle with momentum k1. If you act with H on a state where you have, on for example, this state up above where you have k, two particles with momenta k and k1 and k2, then you get the sum of two delta functions and so when you perform the integral d3k, you get the sum of two energies, um, one for the first particle and one for the second particle. So you would get the thing that you would naturally expect. So k1 plus, oh, sorry, omega sub k1 plus omega sub k2. OK. Everything clear so far? OK. So um, I've used the symbol capital N um, with uh, a bit of forethought, with malice of forethought, because we're going to be interested in studying um, theories where it's possible to create and destroy particles. And so that means that we want to define an operator I'll call it A sub K dagger that creates a particle 
with momentum k. And AK, its Hermitian conjugate, we will see actually destroys a particle with momentum K. So that, for example, the state where you have a particle with momentum K will be given by AK dagger acting on the vacuum. The state where you have two particles with momenta K1 and K2 is given by a pair of these creation operators, AK, dagger, uh, acting on the vacuum, and so on and so forth. And the statement that our particles are symmetric is the statement that these two creation operators with different momenta will commute with one another. And with this definition, the operator n of k is just the usual number operator in, quantum, in the theory of a single harmonic oscillator. And our Hamiltonian is the integral d3k omega sub k ak dagger ak. Remember when we studied the harmonic oscillator, I told you that physics was that subset of human understanding that could be reduced to coupled harmonic oscillators? I think this is an example of that uh, principle at work. So the theory is just an infinite number of simple harmonic oscillators uh, each of which is labeled by a momentum k. And the frequency of each harmonic oscillator is that function that I have called omega, which is k squared plus m squared. So um, indeed, if you remember the problem that I assigned you uh, on your homework where you worked out the Debye model of uh, solids, uh, this is exactly what you did. Okay. Um, uh, you, I think you even used the same notation. You introduced raising and lowering operators, which created collective excitations of the atoms in some solid. And the total energy was the sum overall uh, momenta k of those collective excitations of some frequency omega times the number operator. At least I believe that you did that on one of your problem sets. I may not have phrased it in exactly that, that way. Um, and just like we have a Hamiltonian that generates uh, time translations, we could write down a generator of spatial translations which is, of course, a momentum operator. And that's just the integral d3k of the vector k times ak dagger ak. So what does that do? Well, if you have a particle with momentum k and you act on it with p, you just get k. If you have a two-particle state with momenta k1, k2, you get k1 plus k2, and so on and so forth. So that, for example, P acting on the state K1, K2 is equal to K1 plus K2, the total momentum of the state, times the state, and so on and so forth. So I have now written down for you a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. So I've completely defined the theory for you. So um, I should tell you its name. In fact, uh, this theory uh, is a very famous one. It's known as a free scalar quantum field theory.
So um, there are five words uh, between uh, the uh, uh, little uh, rabbit ears there. So um, let me explain to you what those different five words mean. Well, quantum in theory, uh, you should know what they mean. That's the subject of this, that's the title of this course. Uh, let's explain um, the other three words. So this is a free theory because the Hamiltonian is purely quadratic. That is to say, it only depends on uh, a a dagger. So it's the usual, uh, it's the usual simple harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. And so, in particular, it means that the particles don't interact. Uh, for example, the energy of a pair of particles is the energy of one particle plus the energy of another particle. If the particles interacted, there would be some binding energy. Uh, that would make the particles either want to hang out together or uh, uh, separate or something like that. So a non-free theory would have, for example, uh, terms in the Hamiltonian that include, you know, um, say, uh, 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 operators that would allow two particles, say a k a k, a say if you wanted to add a term in the Hamiltonian that would allow two particles to combine to create a third, then you would include two raising operators and uh, two lowering operators and one raising operator. Here, let me write that out a little bit uh, more explicitly. So, for example. If you wanted to include a term in the Hamiltonian that would allow two particles to combine to create a third, then you would have to include some term in the Hamiltonian like this, which includes two lowering operators uh, and one raising operator. And it would also, of course, have to include the Hermitian conjugate of this term um, because uh, you would want uh, the, the Hamiltonian to be Hermitian. And so that would mean that if it's possible to have two particles to combine to create a third, then it's also possible to have that third particle decay into those two part first two particles. So this would be some two to one interaction. And the Hermitian conjugate would involve two lowering operators, to, or sorry, uh, two raising operators and one lowering operator. So that would be some sort of one to two uh, process. So right now, we're just studying a free quantum field theory, meaning a free theory where the particles just don't interact. But you can easily imagine how you would modify this theory to allow two particles to combine together into a third. And indeed, uh, most of the quantum field theories that one is interested in life are not free theories, uh, they are interacting theories, okay. So such a theory would be an interacting quantum field theory. Okay. So um, that's the use of the word free. Um, so it's free theories that we know how to under solve exactly because we know how to solve the harmonic oscillator exactly. And if you can solve one harmonic oscillator exactly, you can solve an infinite number of harmonic oscillators exactly. Uh, it's only when we include interactions that we need to start developing a complicated machinery, such as the machinery of Feynman diagrams, which allows us to organize uh, the perturbation expansions um, that will allow us to approximate, uh, uh, for example, scattering amplitudes. Um, or energies of states uh, in some systematic way. Okay. So why is it called a scalar theory? Well, it's a scalar theory because we're describing particles without spin. It would be easy enough to generalize what I told you above 
to include uh, a spin label for each particle. That just means that in addition to the momentum of each particle, it will be labeled by a spin. So for example, if you wanted to study a spin one-half system, you would need to label each particle not just by the momentum for three vector k, but also by a, a spin, which would be either up or down. It would live in some two-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and indeed, uh, we're going to describe uh, later on in this course um, the theory of particles with spin in relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, it just remains to me remains uh, for me to describe uh, what is meant by the word field here, and why what I have described here um, is uh, regarded as a field theory. Um, so that's what I'm going to do now. Um, that's a discussion that um, I probably won't be able to finish this class. Uh, so let me just pause and see if there are any questions. No questions? Yes? Um, we use momentum eigenstates because they commute with a Hamiltonian. Okay. This is a free Hamiltonian. Um, so just like uh, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the Hamiltonian is just a function of the momentum. So that means that momentum eigenstates are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. In this theory that we're considering here, momentum eigenstates are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Okay. If you wanted to consider a more complicated interacting theory, then momentum eigenstates, uh, well, uh, then there would be uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian would be much more difficult to write down. And indeed, for a generic interacting theory, um, the construction of the Hilbert space is much more subtle. And indeed, um, uh, we have entire courses uh, devoted to the subject uh, in, you know, uh, so that's not something, for an, an interacting field theory, that's not something that I'm really going to try and tackle this course. Um, I think that I'm not even going to talk about any interactions uh, 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 in our discussion of relativistic quantum mechanics, um, except uh, for those things that we might be able to say based on the symmetries of the system. So for example, you can already just see, uh, based on the construction, uh, the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian, that is to say the conservation of probabilities, requires you to uh, say that if it's possible for two particles to combine into one particle, it also has to be possible for the reverse process, one particle to go into the same, those other two particles. That just follows from the hermeticity of the uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, there was another question? Maybe? Maybe I answered it. Any other questions? Okay. So why is this a field theory? To see why this is a field theory, let us first ask what the observables are of the theory. So, um, in particular, I've written down a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian, but I haven't described to you the natural operators that act on this that give you the observables of the theory. And if you want to make contact with some classical intuition about the system, then we really want to know what those observables are, because those are the things that um, we really have an intuition for, at least in classical physics. So in particular, even before discussing uh, this particular system that I've constructed for you, we know that we're going to want observables which are associated with particular points in space-time. And this is unlike in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, why is that? Well, because we really want to be able to make statements about uh, observables O1 and O2 at causally separated locations 
which means that we need some sort of label that we use to label the operator that tells you a point in space and time where that uh, operator is um, acting. So for example, we seek an operator O of x and t, which answers the question, is there a particle at a position x and t? I want to emphasize that this is different from uh, the uh, way that we formulate non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you just have an <coughs> operator x. That x is not associated with a particular point in space-time. That operator x answers the question, where is the particle? But in relativistic quantum mechanics, because we don't know how many particles we have, we don't know if there are any particles in our state at all, we really need some observables that ask the question, uh, is there a particle? And if so, where is it? And so that means that we need observables that depend on their location. So the question is, uh, before trying to understand quantum theories that have this property, let's first ask if we can think of any classical theories that have the property that there's an observable for each point in space-time. And we have a name for theories that have observables for each point at space-time. We call them field theories. Okay. So a theory with an observable at each point in space-time is a quantum is a field theory. And although the use of the word field here might be new to you, you are in fact intimately familiar with at least one classical field theory. Uh, and the prototypical classical field theory that you know is electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is a classical field theory. The observables in the theory are the electric and magnetic fields, which are functions of space and time. And so um, that means that if you were to, uh, well, so that means that this is a simple example of a theory of fields. Um, it's not a scalar field theory, but rather what is known as a vector field theory. Why is it called a vector field theory? Well, it's called a vector because the observables um, are not scalars, but rather vectors. Okay. There are these vectors E and V. So the theory that we have constructed with the Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian describing single and multi-particle states is some sort of version of electromagnetism. And in fact, um, it's a much simpler version of electromagnetism. So scalar field theory is sort of like a baby version of electromagnetism. And we're describing here is some sort of a simple version of quantum electromagnetism, quantum electrodynamics. So starting next class, I'm going to work out the observe, I'm going to use what we have done to describe to you the observables of this theory. And then uh, we'll understand the equations of motion of the theory, the analog of Maxwell's equations in this theory, uh, before moving on to discuss um, uh, particles with spin and uh, the Dirac equation. So uh, let me stop here and see if there are any questions. Okay, great. Uh, have a nice weekend. I will see you uh, next week.